what I'm talking about today is about research assessment being dull, but very important, I think, for getting RSEs embedded into academic life. Um, and the reason I want to talk about it, the reason I started getting interested in research assessment was because I had I'd moved away from my sort of direct work with the society, but I, I didn't you know I didn't want to still support research software engineers. I was trying to work out how I could do that. And more and more, um, as I worked on in different areas, I realized that research assessment was the area where we really can make a significant difference. So, and and the reason I'm trying to say no really here is that, that I, it's very difficult talking about research assessment. Now, I told one of my friends recently I, that I got an article into Times Higher, and he said, what's it about? And I said, it's really exciting. It's about research assessment. And he, and he looked at me with what I can only describe as pity. Right? But so I, I want to make that case today. Okay. Um, and, it, and it starts really if you start thinking about what's, what is an RSE. And, you know, this is a wonderful thing, way of starting arguments, uh, an RSE con, I find. You know, we could talk about big R, little R, RSEs, and, you know, the kind of work you're doing, whether you should be embedded in a group or, or embedded in a, and, you know, or part of an RSE group. But the thing, I think, that regardless of where you come to this particularly religious argument, right, we can all agree that it's a vital but unrecognized role. Um, and, and there are so many other groups who are in that sort of same, same area. And I realize this would be something that we could start to, to work with. So let's talk about acknowledgement and the way that RSEs are acknowledged. Now, a couple of years ago, um, I did one of my sort of my graph slides. And, um, and, and afterwards, James, who is in the audience today, came back to me and went, there's no number on that. How many responses were there? And I sent in the slides this morning before I added that bit. But for, for James's benefit, 783. <laughs> so, so how, how do we acknowledge RS, RSEs? Well, I, we can find that answer by looking at the International RSE Survey, which we, we run every, every couple of years. Um, and, we can, and these are people, 783 people who responded who said they had done work that ended up in a publication. Um, this is how they were acknowledged in that publication. And you know, it's not. It's not terrible. So more than half of them are being named as co-authors. Um, you know, there's a few main authors. There's still 16% who aren't being acknowledged at all. That's lower than um, when we first measured in 2017. And I was kind of getting into this, and then I was like, hang on. Why are we thinking about publications as the way of, of recognizing research software engineering? Why is, it, why is it we always come back to publications as being the way that you demonstrate your value to the university. You know, there's something, there should be a clue in how we should be recognized for our work, right? And, and I really, I just couldn't quite get away from this idea that there, there must be some other way to recognize not just research software engineers, but also other of these vital but unrecognized roles. Um, and, I, I feel like I've made a career out of putting blindingly obvious things on slides, right? And this is one of them. Um, we need to look at the, the roles that we are supporting research. We need to work out what contribution they're making. And we need to judge that contribution as the way of judging whether they're, they're helping research, whether they should progress their careers and, and everything else on those lines. So that takes me back to saying, Okay, so how do we currently um, assess research? And there were lots of different ways, obviously, we, we, we do that, but it was 2020 by the point I was thinking about this and something had hove into view over the um, horizon. So for, I think, I'm, anybody who works in UK academia will know what the, the Research Excellent frame, Framework, the REF, is. But for those of you who don't know, basically it's an exercise that's conducted every seven years across UK universities and the universities have to put together a case for the, the impact that they've had with their research and a lot of funding is divided up on the back of it. Now, we've campaigned um, uh, with universities as the target for a, for a long time now, 13 years. The one thing they really care about is money. And if you can get to the money, then, then you, you have an, a chance of getting your argument listened to. And this takes us right there. So I started looking into the ref. First thing, let's have a look at what categories are available for submitting outputs this is. And you know, actually it's really broad. There are 21 different categories. Um, you know, and there's all the sort of publications and, and books and parts of books and all these sort of things. And then 
like lo and behold, there it is, software. So this has been around since 2008, um, this set of, of categories. There have been three assessment exercises during the period from 2008 to now. So that's three sets of data I can work on. I'll be able to link the software coming out you know, through gateway to research or through other places to individuals and to universities. So we can start looking at how much funding is put into software, tie that to outputs, direct, tie that directly to the money that universities are getting. You know, like here endeth my, my presentation. So let's go and have a look at how many outputs are being submitted. And um, the keen eyed amongst you might notice a skew in this data. So uh, in the last ref in 2021, 97.8% of all outputs were into publications, so books or journal publications in some form. Everything else is 2.2%. Uh, um, and digital artifacts, where, where software resides, is like less than a percentage. Um, I had a look the other day, I've been working with Mihaela Duto, who's, who's here in the room, um, looking at the ref data, and I was trying to, to identify all of the software outputs. There are 11 of them. There were 186,000 outputs submitted, only 11 are software. And we found out together that um, there are as many outputs that have the word donkey in the title as there are software outputs. I mean, it's really hard to express how small these numbers are. And this is part of the work that I'm doing. Um, when I'm talking with policymakers at the moment, just trying to get across that idea is, is one of the things I've been working on. So I've been trying to say, look, you know, like if you have a fight between an elephant and a gorilla, like who do you expect to win? And that's the fight between publications and non-publications. I haven't quite got to software or get a good way of demonstrating it yet because the scaling doesn't ever work. Um, so we needed to do something about it. And this is where the idea for the hidden ref came. So, so we thought, if there's all of this focus, you know, we've got Research England, and they're coming along with a framework that seems to be a pretty good framework, right? It's a really difficult thing to do to kind of summarize all of the different ways in which research can have impact. The framework seems pretty good, but once it hits the universities, it's getting entirely interpreted um, towards you know, what universities know, which is, which is publications, right? So let's have a think about how we could change this to make all those non-publication things, things work. And that's what the hidden ref was about. So what we said was we took the output categories from the ref and we said, you can submit absolutely anything you want unless it's a publication at which point it's banned, right? So, so everything else, and you know, there's a good range of things there for like, you know, like literally physical artifacts through to musical performances and, and software that we care about, digital, digital and visual media, there's, there's a nice breadth. But once again, we're not the experts, and, and I find this, you know, we sort of moved from research software engineering, and now I'm working with a very broad range of these vital but unrecognized roles, and, and I don't know anything about the areas that they're working in. So what outputs are we missing? Um, and we decided with the hidden ref to actually go out and just ask the community. And this is constantly open. So anybody can say, you know, I think you should be measuring this. And these are the categories that sort of that got through that had enough people voting for them that we thought that we should add them. And I have to say things like training materials uh, really hits home for me. We do a huge amount of training and the materials themselves take a huge amount of effort and work. And then they have a huge amount of impact because, I mean, at the SSI, we're training thousands of people every single year but training materials aren't you know, measured within the ref. Other things like citizen science, community building. Community building, obviously, I'm quite a big fan of. Um, and certainly, I think that, that should be, there should be some kind of way of measuring that and getting recognition for it. So we added all of these categories to those non-publication-based categories, and we ended up with one missing category. And it was people kept coming through to us and saying, we want this person. Um, to, we want to submit a person. So we had technicians and librarians and research managers and, and RSEs, obviously. Um, and we realized what we should do is just have this category called the hidden role. And these would be the, the vital bond recognized people who are working in academia, supporting research. Literally, research could not be done without them. Let's bring them all together under the hidden role category. And we ran a competition to, to get these people uh, to, to see who, you know, what outputs we could collect. 
and we found there were 120 submissions in 2021, 20, 120 submissions over more than 60 universities, I'm not exactly sure how many there were because of the way we collected the data. And as you can see, the hidden role you know, was, was the big one. So it was the one where people really wanted to, um, to gain recognition for individuals. So this was brilliant. It was a lovely, feel-good event. We had a we had an award ceremony at the end, and you know, really felt like we were shining recognition on this small group of people. Um, I have to say, out of all of the campaigns I run, when I've been trying to get press interest in software uh, and software engineering, the importance of that, and then research software engineers, very, very difficult. Getting press interest in this worked really well because it's it's such a broader subject. So, so we have had a lot of interest from it, but it's still you know, a very limited amount of, 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 of impact overall. So we needed something that was more than just this sort of campaign to get people talking in this, this competition. And this is where I think um, we've really started to have a lot of impact where we're going to benefit research software engineers as well. So back to one of my blindingly obvious things to say on, on, on a slide, sort of, the hidden ref, the guiding principle of it now is basically if we don't recognize the people who are vital to research, we limit our ability to conduct research. And I mean, I, I learned that working with RSE, because as soon as we had this growth of RSEs, as soon as we had RSE groups and, and these people all working together, we realized the, the amount of research that we, we were facilitating significantly increased. So this is the guiding principle of the, of the hidden ref. And a lot of people have come along and agreed. So we're now working, obviously, with like technicians who we, we're very closely affiliated with, but also, you know, librarians and chemists and, and like prisons and research managers. And all of these groups of people have all been campaigning like we have to get recognition for the work that we're actually doing rather than recognition via a publication. Um, but it seems that nobody had had this idea of running a slightly anarchic sort of push against the ref and saying we need to change the ref to, to, to actually reflect the world that we live in. Um, so with the backing of these people, big things can happen. Um, in March, was it May this year, uh, we had the Future of Research Assessment Program was announcing the, the changes that were coming through in the next ref, which will be in 2028. And we had really big win for, for the campaign. I was talking about this yesterday at the leaders meeting, uh, but, um, but I shall go through it again. So basically what came out of, of that future research assessment program, one of the changes was that they will allow the submission of outputs by any staff member. And that's a really big increase, a really big change. It's not just ac academics. And if you want to throw into stark relief the kind of culture that we're trying to change, then just look at this sentence which appeared in the report. This will allow the submission of outputs by any staff member, including non-academic staff members. So we say any staff member and then have to back it up by saying and non-academic people are also staff. <laughs> All right. So so that is unfortunately the culture we're pushing against. And, and this is where I come to the sort of call for arms and sort of this is really the, the payload of this entire talk. Um, where we are is we can now submit outputs that we are writing, right? So, and brilliant, well, let's go go back to our universities and just get them submitted. That's not gonna work, right? Because there are a set of panels and everything to get past. People will be want, trying to select the, the stuff they've selected previously. We need to change this culture. So what I would like you to do is when you go back to you, if you work in a university, when you go back to your university, ask your line manager if they know about this change to the coming ref, then I then go to your school, faculty, university, whatever whatever level it's been dealt with, the people who are dealing with your ref submission, and they will be starting, even though it's 2028, they will have already started worrying about it. And it's the right time to start saying this and, and ask them the same question. What's going to happen with the, the previously unsubmitted outputs from, from staff who weren't seen as being academics or weren't academic staff? How can we change it? How can I help you? I'm really, if you can, the more universities we can raise this with at the same time, the more likely we are to be able to change the culture that we're working in. And then also anybody you're working with in your universities, so the technicians, the librarians, the research managers, the whole group, also talk to them because it, it's much better to work together with these groups and try and change the culture across your university at the same time. 
So that's my call to arms. And with that, um, I'll quickly plug the Hidden F Festival, which is taking place in two weeks' time, but there's only like five tickets left, so you'll have to be quick. Um, and I'll say thank you. Thank you, Simon. So we'll just switch over now to Slido. Oh, it's going right. There we go. So the first question we have for you is, do you have any thoughts on why digital outputs may have declined over time in RAT? Yes, but only thoughts. <laughs> I have no evidential basis for this. It feels like when the, the set of outputs first came in, people were interested in in submitting into them. So like, it's like, oh, well, you can do software, you can do web content. Um, and then when that sort of, that was during the RAE, which was in 2008, I think when the results of that came out, people then saw how much had gone into publications and thought, well, that's the safest thing to do. And it's just reduced and reduced since that time. But as I say, it's reduced from about 96% to 97.8%. So it's, well, the opposite, the alternative, 100 minus that, basically. Yeah, a, a small number. A small a number, a small number. number, yeah. Thank you. So the next question we have from Sarah is, I think not all research outputs from a uni are submitted to RAF. For example, academics can be repable or not. Do you have access to research fish or other broader data sets? And, and would you consider using those? Um, so we do have, we've had access to research fish in the past, and it was really interesting to look at software outputs and try and, because there were a lot more of those than, than we'd found in the ref data. Um, certainly interested in trying to tie research fish back to grants and to, to ref um, sort of submissions. But um, I'm, I've lost the, I've lost the original question, I'm afraid it's, it's gone already. Um, so yes, we are interested in working with the research fish, fish data, but it's difficult getting full access across all universities. So the next question we have is, is individual academic recognition the right goal? Most software devs in industry work in big teams with minimal individual recognition, but maybe get paid commensurately. Should RSE roles fit this pattern instead, and is there a trade-off? That's a very good question. So uh, I don't I don't think I'm fighting for individual recognition in the sense of we should be able to pick people out and say this is the best person and this person is slightly worse than them. Right? That's not the, the approach. What I'm trying to do is tie. So when you come to get recognition in um, when you're progressing your career is the most obvious place. I want the the way that your your career is being measured to align with the work that you're doing. It's not really about saying that people are you know people are best and other people aren't as good. Next question we have me from someone else as boss of an RSE group. Yay, we in RSE count as academic enough to be able to do that and get revenue out. My team, but I did this job instead of a normal academic job because I didn't want to do that. Advice, please. Oh, I didn't want to have to write papers. Didn't want to have to write papers. I want to write code. Yeah, well, that, but that's the entire that's the entire point. You should be getting the recognition for the code you write, not for the papers you don't write. That's, that's exactly what I'm arguing for. Okay, coming down the list, and this is again, sorry, not on the screen. Would there be an interest in data assets as outputs? So well curated data sets are very sought after and referenced. Is that something you're interested in helping researchers to curate that share? That's, so like, one of the biggest problems I've had with the Hidden Ref is that we ran this competition to say, like, everybody's in. doesn't matter. It doesn't matter what you're doing. If you work in research, then you're in. And then lots of people emailed and said, am I in because I do this? And they were like, yes, you're in. And then somebody else would say, I, I, I'm not sure if I'm in because I do this. And you're like, no, no, you're in as well. Um, so. I think we're so used to just being told, no, that, that your work is not important to us, that we just can't believe that there might be somewhere we were like, yes, so data sets, absolutely. Where, where would we be? Where would anything be without data? It's the merits of vital importance. So there are data, I don't know, I don't know the 2021 data off the top of my head because I'm more of a favor of the, the 2014. In the 2014, there was 32 software outputs, and I think it was 64 data sets were, again, it was around about 184,000 outputs in total. So yeah, data is of 
like, I mean, again, blindingly obvious things to say, data is very important, um, um, but it's not being recognized in, in the REF. We definitely want to, it, to recognize it, and we certainly want to see it recognized in the 2028 REF. Sorry, did I hear you right? 184,000. 184,000 outputs. 32 software. Yeah. It's, but 186,000 in the 2021, 11 SOP. Wow. Not, it's not many, is it? No. Uh, <laughs> these guys will be doing? <laughs> the next one down the list we have is how are we going to avoid a similar quantity over quality problem that academics have to face? <laughs> Yes, how are we? Um, so I'm, I'm not going. I'm, I'm just not going to pretend I have all the answers. <laughs> Sorry, I could throw something together to say how we are just going to have to. First, the first port of call is making sure that we are being recognised. The next port of call, I think, will be working out how we make sure that that recognition actually has a, some qualitative ability to, like, say, you know, how good the work is. Um, I think one of the things we're trying to do with the hidden ref currently is to write. So feedback we're getting from the panels within universities and with the ref managers is, but we don't know how to do that. Right? We understand publications. Um, we don't understand it appears anything else. Right. So so what we want is guidance. So, so that's what we're going to be working on. So guidance on how to judge software. Well, you know, with the connections that we have very, very easy to write. Guidance on how to judge musical compositions. No, I'm certainly not very well qualified to do that. So it will be all about building communities who know about this area and getting them to put together the guidance that they think is appropriate and then refining it. Um, one of the big problems with working on REF is it's a seven year cycle, right? So I, I don't actually have that many more REFs in me before I retire, right? So, so it, we'll have to see this evolving over time. So hopefully we'll set things in progress now that over the next 7, 14, 21 years, <laughs> we'll have some kind of impact. We're in camera. Oh, yeah, sorry. Yeah. More in camera. Thank you, you've got one minute. I've got one minute, okay. The, the only problem with having questions on Slido is it's, it's like like machine gun fire, isn't it? Like you should buy one after another. So we are going to archive all questions and answers and give you the opportunity to answer them at the end we get that feedback. Okay. Mm -hmm. So would you answer more questions? One more? <laughs> yes, yeah, definitely. Um, so I think I'm just reading. I, I'm Becky, I'm a volunteer chair, and James had to run away. Um, there's been a large amount of research measuring the roles of people in teams, in particular from an area called the science of team science. Would incorporating this into the ref be helpful? Is there anything unique about RSEs? Well, that's definitely something unique about RSEs. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, come on. Um, so yeah, so there's been a lot of different groups working on team science and obviously pushing that agenda. They frequently RSEs aren't, you know, when you read about this, you don't see research software engineering in it, but but uh, but I'm trying to change that. Definitely will take anything that already exists and use it. So I'm not aware, I have to say, of the science of team science, and I would love whoever put that up to 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 um send me a link. Um my contacts are on my slides. Okay. You're keen on it, okay. okay. Is it that your question? No. No. <laughs> I'll talk I'll talk to you, Carol. Yeah, please. Yeah, thank you.